Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Mitality. Uh, we're a podcast that of uh, persevering through adversity and also gaining courage through knowledge. And if you remember our last time, our my guest was Eric Falgu. He's an influencer, has a podcast, Eric's ADHD Experience. He's a business owner, but he was also a former drug addict and uh, a gambling addict mm-hmm. and had some financial problems as a result of both of those. And And uh, we had a wonderful talk, and I appreciate you being an open book and and, and just uh, letting us know what it was like to, to, to go through that because many people are going through yes. such experiences. Um, I, I don't know. We, we, you ended the last episode where we were talking about fear and anxiety mm-hmm. a little bit, just a little bit, yeah. because I know I wanted to expand upon that in this episode. And um, we were just talking a little bit ago, mm-hmm. and you had mentioned that you didn't really fear, I mean, feel the fear and anxiety that I would think that you would right. when you realize how horrible your life had become and things. Now, I know fear and anxiety from having cancer mm-hmm. and getting the news, you know, and, and, yes. and things. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I'm sure many of our listeners have gone through um, when it comes to disease, that sort yeah. of thing. But you had mentioned that you just, you didn't feel that fear or anxiety. I guess at a point where you're at a rock bottom and, um, my biggest, I would say, fear that led me up to that point was always about money. Oh, you know, I've uh, you know, coming oh, from a divorce, keep going. With- Correct, because uh, I never felt like I made enough money in my career, and um, when I finally was at a place where I thought I was catching some headway, and I'm like, oh, I'm actually, you know, I'm paying for a wedding, I bought a ring, I'm moving into an, a condo with my ex fiance. I thought at that point in my life I was making good money, but coming from a divorced family where you know. Both parents really didn't have much to contribute. You know, mm-hmm. they give you a roof over your head, um, this and that. Uh, you know, my family's not wealthy. So I always worked. Worked at the age of 14. I've been working my whole life. And even up until that point through the addiction, I never felt like I made enough money. And so when I got hooked on the gambling, I was like, oh, my God, I need to make more money. I need yeah. to make more money. And, you know, you always say, like, oh, when I win this money, I'm going to go do this or You're I'm right. going to do that. And, and, and unfortunately, that's a grandiose idea because it never happens. And that was like my biggest fear. Always thought that I could like come out of it, but when I became dead broke, and then I was like, oh my God, I can't stop. That's when just everything, you, you kind of feel like nothingness, man. Well, Eric, you mentioned that you were $98,000 yes. in debt from gambling. Yes. And I, I mean, uh, to think $98,000 in debt, you know, would just absolutely drive me crazy. Yeah. And, um, and also, and I'd never got, been in debt before in my life, like to where like I, you know, everything was always paid on time. And, you know, I never, never had like a credit card that was, you know, maxed out, you know, so I was that guy. I was the guy that just always kept on top of his stuff. But you know what? Um, uh, so who were you in debt to? Because I have to tell you here in New Orleans, I, mm-hmm. there's some uh, shady characters right. and to be in debt to them, right. I, that would be absolute right. fear. Right. Well, well, luckily for me, I, uh, I never partook in any, um, sports bets. Like I didn't have any bookies. Um, most of my debt was acquired through purchasing and leasing a new vehicle. Mm. that I was making payments on up until I went to rehab, uh, three credit cards maxed out 30,000 altogether. Um, two years of taxes because I started neglecting my business, uh, which, you know, so that was like close to eight or 10. And, um, I owed my dad some money and I owed one other person some money, but it wasn't crazy like that. And then just trying to get out of that was very overwhelming because now you're not really making much money when you first come out. So, yeah. Well, a lot of times I, I, I think fear and anxiety. And when I say anxiety, I'm not going to be talking about, or we won't be talking about uh, anxiety disorders because that's a that's a, a clinical totally thing. Yeah, yeah sure, totally different. Sure. But everyone feels anxious and and that kind of stuff. A lot of that is driven by emotions, correct? Um, and ne- not necessarily fact because I know when I had uh, uh, cancer, sometimes I was af- afraid about things, and I'm using the word af- afraid. I was concerned about things, but it wasn't based upon 
fact, mm-hmm. it was based upon uh, my emotions how or how felt. I felt. Yes. And I know we're in a society right now where everything, you know, you you do what you feel, but that's not always good. Right. Right. And getting some facts, some of the times I got uh, fear and anxiety from Googling too much. Yeah. You know, isn't no. that the worst thing to do? Yeah. You know, and, don't and, things, and I don't know. Did out. you Google for, about your gambling or your drugs? No, thing? man. Did it come out of it? or? Well, unfortunately, <laughs> I like, I, I never thought I had a problem until... My friend told me, hey, man, I don't even like hanging out with you anymore. Oh, God. And, uh, and that was through the cocaine use. But he realized that the gambling was like, because he knew, my, you know, he, he was one of my roommates, you know. So he, he was like, you know, you're a guy that he I look up to. That's what he would tell me. You know, you're very responsible. You've always managed your money well. And um, for him to see me, like, just start throwing it away, you know, because, you know, I have all these hopes and dreams and aspirations. And, and this was way before the the podcast came along. I was wanting to build this big old salon. And um, when he started seeing me do that, he found a, 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 a GA meeting, a Gamblers Anonymous meeting. And I had never heard of that. I didn't think that was a thing. And uh, I was like, no, man, I'm addicted to cocaine. You know, like the gambling, I was still kind of like trickling into that. Mm-hmm. But that, that happened so much quicker than the cocaine. Like the, you know, the cocaine period was a long use of time, whereas the gambling was like a nine month stint. And I like completely lost everything. Ruined my business, completely broke. I had no money to my name. Um, and that, it, it was crazy because uh, I just was like, how did this happen so fast compared to the other thing? But they, they both went hand in hand. You know? Night Nighttime was always the worst for me. What, how about, was it the worst for you too? Unfortunately, during the day, I wouldn't gamble much because I was at work. And uh, I always felt safer during the day. And it was weird at night if I were to go home alone, even though I had a roommate at the time. And uh, and we actually, it was two roommates living with me. I was just so afraid to go to sleep by myself. For one, I was afraid that I wouldn't wake up because I oh. always oversleep, have a hard time getting mm-hmm. up. And two, I just, I didn't want to feel like I was by myself. So then I would go to the casino or to like a gambling establishment where even though I didn't hang out with anyone, I would still gamble alone. I still had that sense of like, okay, I'm by myself. People are around. Cool. That that was like my safe space. But really, you're still alone. You're sitting at a machine. You're lifeless. I, I wish I had the recordings of those uh, cameras because I used to sit right by one next to a corner. And I was just like, man, I'd pay a lot of money to see that guy. Just, just, just watch him. Because... You know, I, I remember still very vividly, um, even though it was years ago, I just remember just sitting there just like in my head going, like, why are you doing this to yourself? Like, why are you still sitting here? Like, what is your problem? Like, why can't you stop? And sure. you learn about that um, in, in the program. And a lot of it is anxiety of just, you know, feeling like you're not enough. Um, you know, they say that gamblers uh, think that they don't deserve to be happy. So they punish themselves with more gambling, just like drug use. And uh, and that comes from depression, anxiety, fear, all those things. Well, sure, you know, and that's a, a lot of us go through anxiety and fear yes. because we feel yes. we don't yes. deserve right. a lot of right. the, the, the happiness right. That, that right. Which is which is sad because everybody yeah, deserves this. to be happy. Um, you know, the average typical human when they get upset or or even like a little pissed or a little anxiety, they're not going to go gamble or do cocaine. They're just going to go blow off some steam, watch TV. They might go watch a football game or whatever they're doing. I felt like, hey, man, this is what I got to do because this is the only thing that makes me feel good. But then even when you're on it or doing it, you don't feel good at all. It's like, it's then you're like, I want it to stop, right. but I can't. And that's where the addiction is just like, um, they, they call it something, and I, and I forget in the big book, but... uh. It's like this sort of like grip that that it has on you because, you know, believe it or not, man, like even though I'm in the program and I am, you know, I'm almost six years sober now from cocaine and gambling, the addiction is so strong that it's always working. So, you know, I like to go to the gym. I like to take care of my body and all these things. My sponsor used to say, you need to work on your spiritual gym. You need to work on this, you know, not, you know, this, no, mm-hmm. not so much this because while you're at the gym doing push-ups, that thing's out there doing push-ups. And it's waiting to catch you off guard under the right set of circumstances. And uh, and it happens. People relapse all the time just from not putting up certain roadblocks, not putting themselves, you know, changing your people, places, things. You know, I had to change my entire life when I came out. I had to, I had to completely remove myself from the salon I was at. I didn't even like work at the same job anymore. 
Um, it, it was a, it was a lot of uh, it was a lot of doing that 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 kept me where I'm at now. But you always felt like you were going to come out of it. Then I mean, just I, I knowing did. you, I, I I did I did up until the end. And then, um, I mean, there was a point where one time, man, I put a gun to my head and I was like, I knew I wouldn't do it. I wanted to do it so bad. And uh, just, I was too too scared to do it. And then I was like, but I knew I didn't want to die either. But right. I, I, I'm telling you, Gary, there there were mo mornings, <laughs> multiple mornings in a row where, you know, I would make money doing hair. I would make money gambling, make money with the cocaine. And then uh, I'll never forget Cinco de Mayo. I had probably made like $6,000 that day between all of my jobs at the time. And uh, the next morning I was completely broke. And I remember driving my brand new Tahoe, you know, that was when I had the long hair and all that stuff. And I'm like freaking screaming. I got the windows down and I'm freaking yelling so loud. And I'm, I don't even know how fast I was going, but I wanted to crash it so bad because it's like, how am I going? Like, how did this happen? How am I going to fix this? Oh, go back to work, go make more money. And then, and then you do, you, it was a very, very vicious, I always called it like a shitty record that I was listening sure. to. And that's pretty much. Wow. That makes me sad to hear. You don't, you don't even think, but yeah. I know that there are people like that that are oh, man. they're in that situation yeah. right now yeah. And, yeah. and everything. I always felt better in the morning. Mm -hmm. Nights were always bad, For sure. especially when you're, you're sick. I, especially, I remember uh, a couple of months of chemo and then right in the middle of the night, I had... Um, I lived with my sister and brother-in-law for mm -hmm, a year. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I did. And everybody just took care of me and, yeah. and to help me uh, get well. And so I knew that they were sleepy. So at nighttime, even while I was sick, I knew that they needed to have their rest yes. and, and things. So nighttime was a, a terrible regarding. I think I would get down. I If I was to be honest with myself, I think I went through periods of depression also. Rightfully so. And and certainly not to the point of what you just described. Right. But right. I always seemed to sleep, though, once I saw the sun come up. Oh, wow. I could see the, uh, uh, you know, just, you know, that little bit of beautiful. light coming yeah. through. And it was. It was beautiful. It was beautiful to see that. But then I could sleep. Because I knew everything was going to be right. Because so you know what they say is it's brighter in the morning. Correct. But what you went through, I'm not quite sure. I mean, was it brighter in the morning? Well, that's a funny. Uh, that's a funny thing because since I stayed up three days at a time, I always saw the sun go down, and I would always see the sun come up. And I remember one particular morning, pretty much close to the end of uh, of me going into treatment. Um, I was completely broke and I'm like, okay, I need to find four quarters so I can make a dollar to go put a dollar into this machine and just mm -hmm. hit, hit it four times. And I remember walking around outside, smoking a cigarette, looking through this parking lot. And I'm like, I look crazy out here looking for quarters. Oh, and, and, and I remember the sun started coming up. And when that started happening, that was when I got pretty upset and mad and then i just like uh i went back inside and then my ex-wife at the time called my sponsor and uh that was the first time that he had physically come and like pulled removed me from a place and i just remember being so angry and just beating my brand new truck to pieces i mean i freaking i had to, i had to put it in a uh uh, auto shop because I started kicking it and beating the crap out of it and you know because you basically you're mad at yourself you're like you know yeah. and, and that was yeah. part of, yeah man so yeah I've seen the sun go up and come down multiple times I was actually afraid to go to sleep where are you yeah just because I didn't want to not wake up for work right and part of me was just like as long as I stay up uh I, I don't know man it, it, it was just I was sick you yeah. know and that's what yeah. I think a lot of people don't you know with addiction you know if you think it's not a disease if you think it's not an illness it is um, when I heard that, when I first went to my first meeting, I thought it was BS. And um, I just was like, hey, you know what? I have this like little issue, you know, but besides that, I'm good. But no, as it progressively got worse, like they say in the book, you start realizing like, oh, crap, this is a disease. Because a lot of people don't believe that, right? right? There's a lot of people out in the world that don't believe that addiction. They think it's all up here. In retrospect, it is, but it it, it all stems from something else. And that's the, the anxiety, the fear, the depression. And, and, you know, people do have addictive personalities. So um, I think bringing like that to awareness is, is uh, I think what we need to work on now, you know? Oh, absolutely. You know, I had, uh, what are some of the things though that kept you going that you actually said to yourself to try to, um, Keep going, mm -hmm. and to you know, to make sure that you didn't 
do some of the things that right. are permanent in your life, you know, like? Well, one of them is, uh, I'm going to be honest, it, it was you. Like what you told me that day that I was driving, you know, I remember us talking about, uh, you know, like you were like joking about it. You're like, oh, yeah, man, everything's going to be OK. And, you know, it's like it's you were joking about you were just being, you know, uh, I, I what's the word optimistic, right? Like you were just. Yeah, I was optimistic. I, 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 you know, I can't say that I was a joker right. about it, you know, because I took it very, very seriously. For sure, yeah. But um, I, and and I'll was, tell after after you say what you yeah. say, I'll tell you what my philosophy was. It, about. It, it was the way that you said it in a sense that when I was laying there in the facility, uh, going through the program, I was like, okay, you know, remember what Gary said. Remember how he said you got to be positive and you got to look at things on the bright side because, like, you know, realistically, you thought that if if you started putting yourself down and feeling down, it like you would just progressively maybe get worse, like. I don't, I, you didn't say it in that sense, yeah, but no, it, no, it, right. it was your attitude towards right. it. And, you know, that showed me that, okay, well, maybe I need to start having a more positive outlook because, again, you're being positive about um, beating this disease. And I'm over here with a different disease, but, you know, I'm not being diagnosed with something that can kill me. And I'm over here just like not appreciating my life and not respecting myself and i just felt like i started using things that you told me and i was like well if he's fighting i'm gonna fight um obviously you know at my family my, my nephew was just born and uh i remember my sister not wanting me to be his godfather which i thought was kind of oh, crazy wow. and so i mm -hmm. remember things like that um my ex-wife at the time was um you know in my corner and i'm sitting there going man like i'm i have all these like beautiful things in my life like what is your problem and um, I just had to start realizing, like, your life's not that bad. And then, and then you heard all these other people's stories. You see, they, they call it the medicine when you go to, like, a meeting, you know, because as an addict and as a sober addict, you know, you kind of forget, like, what happened. Or, you know, you're like, oh, you know, that was a long time ago. But when you go to these meetings and, and you go to get your medicine, they call it, you'll hear somebody fresh out, you know, fresh in addiction or they just lost all their money or, you know, um, you know they're, they can't stop taking opioids. And you remember how bad it is. Sure. And when you hear that, you realize, you know what? It's still bad out there. Yeah. And, and so it, it makes you think of how far you've come and, and all the things you had to work on. And, and it's, a, it's a daily process. They call well, absolutely. It, yeah, they call it character defects um, in the program. You know, I certainly was realistic, though, mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with my cancer and, and even the prognosis because, uh, you know, I— you know, I was told I probably wouldn't make it and things, but uh, uh, I always, there, there. there's several things that I did mm -hmm. during mine, and I don't know if, if you can relate to, to this, but there's, I always expected good things. And I thought that that was very important. I expected my treatments to work. I believed that they would work. Positivity, man. And yes. And when I went into there, I didn't go through with that. Oh, why, why is this happening to me? Oh, why did I get cancer? Or why, right. you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, 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 I didn't do that. The whining and belly again yeah, is just not in my the nature. Pity, pity. You didn't right. do that. But I always did expect my treatment to work. And even if the prognosis was not right, I wanted that uh, treatment to work. Yes. And... I even, and I accepted small victories, Yes, you know, and anything was a small victory. I mean, and, and, uh, uh, uh and things, but I would even sit there and imagine being healed. Hmm. And, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Luke eight, but the woman who touched Jesus's robe, that's all she wanted to do right. was to touch Jesus's robe. And she knew she would be healed. And there'd be times in the morning I would just sit there in my recliner and I would have a, a vision. Maybe Jesus is surrounded by people who needed help because I'm not the only one that needed help, right. you know, with cancer and right. everything else. And I would, I never believed I was the only one. Right. But I just thought I imagined myself just reaching through the crowd, and if I could just touch Jesus's robe, I knew I'd be healed. Wow. And then I'd let that power come back to me. And. I expected it. I expected it. And I, and I would thank Jesus for my healing. Yes. You know what? And I didn't pray about it all the time, but I did, uh, uh, I did 
expect that it was going to be happening. And I thanked him every day. Oh, thank you for whatever, you know, whatever. Yes. I didn't wake up every day feeling great. Okay. Yeah. But I thanked him about it. And so that's the other thing is just having a, a, a grateful heart, I think, helps people who are fearing or have some anxiety to get past things is to you can't go through life bitter, angry, wondering, um, just uh, thinking the worst about yeah. things. That, that was me, man. Yeah. Oh, yo, you, you were felt you were feeling that way. For, um, from from the uh, again going back, I because I didn't start going to like actual therapy till the age of thirty. Yeah, when me and uh, the ex originally split up, and um, for the first time in my life, this lady is telling me like, "Hey, the reason why you act the way that you act is because subconsciously you're afraid people are going to walk out of your life like your uh -huh. dad left you." Because when I was three, you know, he told me he was coming back and he had to leave for a little bit. And uh, I remember him like starting to cry because my dad's an emotional dude and I'm, I'm an emotional guy too. And he kissed me and said, I'll, I'll be back soon. And he got in his cop car and he left. And I just remember watching that through like the screen door. And I didn't cry, but I remember it very vividly. Sure. And, and that caused my entire life to think, never knowing this, Yeah. you know, like there's certain times where I should have like maybe stuck up for myself more for certain situations, but subconsciously, Oh, Eric, if you make that person mad, they're not going to be your friend. I was always afraid that you wouldn't like me if I said something to you. So that caused a lot of problems, man. Don't Most we of do my that? life. Uh, yeah, but, but we a lot always of do that, though. We yeah, put those. But a lot of people thoughts? stick up for themselves. I felt like more than I did. Oh, and I, I always felt mm -hmm. like, uh, oh my God, if I tell this person something, they're going to be mad at me. I, I guess I didn't want anybody to hate me because of what happened, not knowing that until the age of 30. And when she said that, it started making a lot of sense. And I had to start learning how to prioritize people and putting boundaries up for myself because most of my addiction and my depression was bitterness. I was angry. I was mad at everybody. Um, I felt like, you know, why uh, isn't things happening? Like, why aren't, aren't I this, like, great hairstylist? You know, because I felt like I was a prodigy and I felt like I put the time and the work in. Sure. So I kind of felt like at a point in my life, I just felt like I wasn't uh, where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, not being grateful, even though I, I would preach to people that I am, no, but I, I was I was yeah, angry I and mad. Mean, yeah. and, and the more anger and the more bitterness, man, the, the worse it got. And uh, so I'm not like that today, but I had to learn how to like let go. I'm, um, I, I, I really, Try to work hard at being grateful and being grateful of the people who are in my life. Um, I do have problems mm -hmm. of driving on the 610 or I-10 oh, yeah. through New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not very grateful as no, I'm no. weaving in and out of that traffic. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I am a, an aggressive down. SOB sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm not happy with myself. But anyway, aside from that, right. I try to be grateful. The other thing I d did, and I accepted the fact that there were going to be setbacks that I wasn't always going to go forward. Right. Meaning, uh, you know, like I believe the two steps forward, one step back, but not to get down on myself when my treatment didn't work or when my numbers, you know, blood numbers or yes. the tumor didn't uh, shrink as much as I thought it would. Right. Um, and and people, we, we can do that. And I, I say people, no, I can do that. I can get down. Right on bad results and we just have to know that that's going to be a part of the healing process yeah. is you're going to be, have forward make forward but there is a now and many times it doesn't always happen you know like i, I was prepared that the treatment wouldn't work mm -hmm. okay and that uh, my prognosis would not uh, end up good and, and things but i always wanted to believe right. and i did believe right. and i accepted uh the times when well, my uh, my sponsor Steve, uh, the first one of the first things he taught me in the program was that um, life's gonna happen on life's terms. It's how we react, and uh, Eric always reacted differently, you know, back then mm -hmm. because Eric would be mad and all these things, and you know, now when life happens to Eric, he doesn't react. Yeah, he just, which is which is a it, it's actually like a relief because uh, you can't control any outcome and. No. You saying that always made me feel like, man, you know, I need to start looking at things from like Gary's perspective or even Steve's perspective, because I always wondered how like you or him or people like y'all had that. I was like, how do you have that? Like, how come I'm not like that? But that took 
you know, learning the character defects, which is basically the, all these different emotions and having to learn how to go, hey, man, you know, there's these emotions that you carry that you can work on. You but, know, Eric, you know what? That's some part of the uh, that uh, some of the fear and, and anxiousness that a lot of people have is because we do compare ourselves. Oh, yeah. With our name. 100%. You know, yeah. Why isn't my 100%. treatment going like so and so? Why was right. Why did they heal and I didn't right. and, and, and things. And right. that is something that we need to stop doing is comparing. And it, again, it's part of a grateful heart is to yes. um, be grateful for what you have and yes. what has accomplished yes. Yes. and not comparing. But it's, that is a, I think that's human nature it is. to try it to is. just uh, do some comparisons. Yeah. We, um, it, it's just part of, uh, the world we live in today. You know, mm-hmm. it's just oh, like, absolutely. you know, there's all, you oh. know, everything's great, right. You know, yeah, everything's you great on your phone. You're like, Oh man, they got it better than me. But honestly, uh, what I've been learning the past couple of years, probably the last year is that honestly, all you need is God. Um, he's with you no matter what. And, uh, with, you know, cause you are a child of God and that's been helping me get through everything lately. Sure. Because, I just started not feeling alone, really not feeling alone, even when I'm in a room by myself or a building by myself because I have him, you know, and since I've learned that because I'm still learning, student of life, I just never really feel anxious. I never really feel like I have to worry, you know, obviously, you know, you're going to worry about certain things like, all right, I need to pay this bill or this has to be done or this client's 10 minutes late shit. That's going to push me back. But besides that, I don't really have that same feeling anymore, which is. For me, that that's a. I turn it over. Yeah, you yeah. just turn it over. You have to. He sees the beginning and the end, and mm-hmm. I just see this one little yeah. spot. Yeah. And so I turn it over, and I know that in his time, in yes. his time, may not be what I want, but Learning in his time, well. it it it's gonna it's gonna be. One 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 thing before mm-hmm. we have to go, um, I see many people who are even afraid of becoming healed gotcha. you know they may not like the situation mm-hmm. where they're in oh. but the unknown i can answer that the unknown mm-hmm. of is, is scarier yeah. to them yeah and from your situation what does that mean to you most um addicts um they don't want to own up to what they've done you mm-hmm. know because when you get out you have all this stuff, right? You have all this debt. You have all this money you owe. You have all these people to apologize. You have this job to go back to or this new job to get because you got fired. And uh, it's that's part of the King Baby Syndrome, as they call it. It's uh, the 29 character defects, which basically when I started reading up on, I have like 25 of them or I had, you know, you're always going to have them, but like working on them daily. It's like child adolescent thoughts as like an adult. Sure. And, that, and that's like, you know, selfishness, pride, ego. And when you become sober and you start putting your life back together, you're like, oh my God, man, I have to pay this. I have to pay. You basically, it's the consequences of your actions. And so that's life. And you just have to own up to that. And it's really a thing of um, becoming re- not, I guess, responsible. Or yeah. Owning up yeah. To your accountable, stuff. responsible. Yeah, accountable. Yes, and, yes, and, yes. and absolutely. And yeah, we're and getting terrible really as a society anymore about being accountable yeah. for, for things. Nobody wants to be. And, well, and nobody can do it for you. It's really a lot of it is uh, up to you mm-hmm. to uh, mm-hmm. uh, make that. But being afraid, I, you know, back, oh, it's been 25 years, uh, 25 years. And and I'm a full belief in, in therapy to help oh, people 100%. get through. It, it changed my uh, life. It saved that, my life. It oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. It, it, me I love too. it. I love it. And, 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 and talking and with it. But one of the things about uh, therapy is they, they ground you for today yeah. so that you don't think about what happened to you in the past and they can't hurt you in, in the Correct. future Correct. And, and things. But I had a, 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 I have a friend. He's an older gentleman and uh, he had indicated to me, he used a, um, you, you, you've probably heard before that a seed has to die before a plant will grow. Uh, have you heard that before? That's, New for me, kind of. Uh, uh, the seed has to die? As, well, the seed dies. Oh, gotcha. The seed dies, and then the plant grows mm-hmm. from that. Mm-hmm. But basically, you see a seed, and it it represents new growth and whatever. Correct. But it dies so that the real growth, gotcha. that plant, you know, that strong. What's and, inside. And such, yeah, it can, it can grow. So anyway, he had mentioned that to me, and, and it really stuck with me for the past 25 years. I wrote something. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, it's kind of a poem, not really a poem, because I don't write poetry or right, anything right. like that. But it just it, novels. Yeah, yeah, I just write <laughs> novels and everything. But I did write this based upon with that. Okay. And if if you don't mind me reading no, it to please, you, please, I I'd like to read it and then uh, uh, talk about it briefly. I I mentioned I named it New Life. It's beautiful. As we know, a new plant cannot have life until the seed dies. In many ways, you too may feel you have been experiencing a death these past few days, weeks, or months, at different times, maybe even now. And it's true. Some things in your life are now changing. Some things in your life must die for a new life to begin. But you will experience a great resurrection in that change. So today, and each day forward, promise yourself that life and never doubt it. I've it's pulled beautiful. over the past 25 years, I've pulled this at back to remind myself things that I want to, that I want to change. Mm -hmm. And I also remind myself that if I want things to change, then I can't keep doing the same behaviors over and over, over. I'm going to get the freak, same freaking ass results. You know what they call that? What? Insanity. What? Insanity? The definition of insanity oh. is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. That's but what we do that. All the time. And, and, and sometimes, even though I know that. Correct. Intellectually and emotionally, I reread this to remind right. myself, don't do that. Don't go down, to, down that road. But we do that well, over and over. Well, because most people don't want to admit that they need to change. Right. You know, and I think right. that that comes with the ego and the self. Uh, like uh, my sponsor said, the the old self must die in order for the new self to be reborn. Absolutely. And also, what I just learned at that ceremony that I uh, participated in a few weeks ago, one of the shamans was saying that, you know, in order to get something, you have to sacrifice something. And he said, you have to sacrifice something that you might really like, in order for this new thing in your life to be born. And when he told me that, I was like, wow. Because, you know, I've, I feel like I've done a lot of sacrificing sure. and I, I've given up a lot of things and, you know, I've, I've quit a lot of things. But I like like for a bigger calling that you're going for, like you're going to sacrifice something because I always thought, well, why can't I keep all these things? Right. And, and still get what I want. Right. But it doesn't work that way because that's life. Right. And I was like, wow. So uh, I've been holding on to that, too. And that that's a uh, that's. But you, that. And there, there's other things you can do. Oh, and, 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 and uh, I've got other we probably need to end this episode right now, but but we need uh, but there's other things I want to have on future episodes, such as meditation, yes. breathing. Yes. I mean, you were talking to yep. me today yep. about yep. Uh, about McCall, breathing, and out. yeah, Mac McCall, he's going to be a guest on the yes, on sir. the show, yes, sir. and it's a lot of things we can do to help us through. Fear, anxiety, and just natural things. Very natural. Absolutely. We don't have to pop a pill no, to feel better. No. I mean, some people do, and I'm not right denying that, but I was I was gonna say, like, um going through all these things that I've been through and like having to, you know, because I've done experiments on myself, things like that. And when I say experiments, I mean like giving up coffee, giving up this, giving up that. Realistically, mm -hmm. unless you have like a physical mental condition where like, hey, you might need this pill for your um, Tourette's or, you know, because there are debilitating things that people just cannot control. Sure. The, the average person, you really just need yourself. Yeah. Be, be uh, uh, sober. <laughs> And, you know, just learning those techniques, like Lisa that was doing sound therapy on the podcast. Right. I mean, those breathing, like she did breath work in uh, Greece, and she said that heals. And yeah. Max said the same thing. And I'm like, man. So, yeah, there's a lot of holistic types there of is. natural stuff. And yep. it's, it's. Well, there's more we could, we could do on yeah, this. Know, and, and, and I appreciate everybody tuning in to, to this. And, and Eric had uh, mentioned a few a guest that he had had on Eric's ADHD experience. So tune into that podcast if you have a chance. But in the meantime, uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more in future episodes about fear and anxiety and, and, and things. And please, if you will s subscribe to this and you can be, can be sure to get those episodes to you and, uh, uh, and tune into our website as well as email me at mytality podcast at gmail.com. Let me know what you're going through. Let us know what 
we can think about and pray for you on so that you, we can get to some healing because we do want to have you well. But in the meantime, please stay well, everyone, and God bless.